You're listening to a sermon from the Spring Midtown Church in Phoenix, Arizona. If you'd like to learn more about the Spring and its ministry, please visit thespringmidtown.org or follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Today we're going to start a new series and we're calling it Hashtag Here, Hashtag Now, Hashtag Us. Here, now us. We're going to be walking through the book of Nehemiah together. And I'm really excited because most people don't know the book of Nehemiah exists. It comes just before Job and the Psalms. And it's the incredible true story of a guy who lived a pretty comfortable, safe, secure, easy life. And he gave all of that up because he heard God's call to get involved. And you and I, we live in unprecedented times. And God is definitely calling us here and now. So the question, of course, is what exactly are we called to do in rebuilding in a broken world? And that's where we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah, because his story will help us to hear uh, how God calls people to rebuild in broken seasons and broken times. If you would turn with me a Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1, It's in the Old Testament. It's before Job and the Psalms. It's always good to be in the habit of opening a Bible. Open the Bible. Leave a bookmark in here. You can read it throughout the week and throughout the coming weeks. That's not spoilers. It's actually okay to read ahead in your Bible all on your own to come and and just be ready to hear verses uh, that you're curious about. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're starting at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Chislev, the 20th year, when I was in Susa, the capital, One of my brothers, Anani, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them about the Jews that survived, those who escaped the captivity, and about Jerusalem. They replied, the survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eye be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. We have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, statutes, and ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the words that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At that time, I was the cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do you respond to bad news? Well, the New York Times tells the approach of the most ignorant man in the world. His name is Mr. Eric Hagerman. Mr. Hagerman is the most ignorant man in the world by choice. In 2016, he responded really badly to the presidential election. It was just really problematic for him. And Mr. Hagerman decided he would learn nothing about the United States of America that happened after November the 8th, 2016. Nothing. You see, he was a well-placed, white, progressive, upper-middle-class to upper-class Nike executive living in the Pacific Northwest, and the election was just too hard for him to hear, and so he just stopped. He stopped listening to the news. He gave up on all Facebook. He doesn't really go online. He can't watch TV. He watches sports, but with the sound off. Cleveland Cavaliers. That's his favorite team. He sold his house and quit his job. He bought a pig farm in rural Ohio where there would be no news. 
And every day he goes into town because he still wants luxuries. He goes to the coffee shop, but he goes before most of the people who work there would actually be there. And most of the people who go there would actually be there. And still he has headphones in his ears, blaring white noise. He said he used to listen to music, but sometimes songs can be political. And sometimes things can creep in between the songs. And when he gets to the counter, the baristas know what to do. They flip over the newspapers and they don't attempt to discuss current events with him because he doesn't know what's happening and he doesn't want to know what's happening. They give him his triple latte and he goes home where he lives alone and reads books and basically just lives his life. And his friends talk about this and they're astounded and jealous a little bit and also offended that anyone could really try to live this way. He doesn't know any, this article came out in 2017. He does not know anything that has happened since before the election. He doesn't know about Nazis in the Carolinas. He doesn't know that we sort of almost went to war with Iran and North Korea. He doesn't know what's happened to healthcare in America. He doesn't know that black men are getting shot. He doesn't know about the Black Lives Matter movement. Never heard of it. He does not know anything that has happened in the United States of America since 2016. His brother forced him to learn about Equifax for his protection. So there's a decent chance he knows about the pandemic. He probably has seen people in masks, but I doubt he knows everything that's happening or really anything that's happening beyond the fact that he should stay away from people and wear a mask, which let's be real, he does anyway, because that's the life he's chosen a very self-absorbed existence. Most of us would enjoy creating a dream world. He can actually afford to do it. Now the problem, of course, right, for Christians is that as attractive as that may sound, and I'll level with you, when I read the article, I thought, man, that would be nice. It would be nice to have just a farm and just leave everybody else to deal with their problems. But the problem is that you and I have been called to be in the world and not of the world, right? That's what Jesus says. Uh, Really, the Bible talks about the, the fact that we're called to bear witness. An essential part of bearing witness is that we hold a Bible in one hand and we hold the headlines in another. Both things at once. Christians sometimes are tempted just to hold the Bible and to kind of give up on what's going on in the world because we've got this great God and hopefully at some point he does something about things and it's not my problem. And likewise, folks who don't know Jesus are tempted to just hold on to the headlines. They don't really have the Bible. And so they find that actually the world is, is pretty messy and pretty messed up, but they don't really have any solutions for it. It's kind of always been messy and it seems to be getting messier. And you and I are called to, to hold both in our hands and to cry out to God and say, look, do you see what's happening? Like, do you know what's going on in this world? And yet at the same time, we know that he does because we know his story and we know who he is. And well, really, we're also called to bear witness to the fact that he has this kingdom that is slowly and steadily breaking into this world. And so we see right alongside our friends, stuck in culture without any real hope, the same issues, and yet we have hope. And so we can talk about, well, this God who loves them and this God who actually slowly and steadily is transforming the world in which we live. You and I are called to bear witness, to hang on to scripture and to hang on to the headlines and to consistently talk about the God that we believe in, the God we've come to know in Jesus Christ. Because we know there is actually no solution to these headlines that comes from the progressive movement. It won't come from the progressive movement. And it won't come from the conservative movement. It won't be more taxes or less taxes. I mean, when you even think about it, that's really naive, either one. There won't be more freedom or more education. What it's going to have to be is, is more of Jesus Christ in our lives, that we would actually listen to the words of Jesus, that we would actually live the way that he lives, that we would care about God's justice, God's kingdom, and most importantly, that we would bear news to the good news that we would bear witness to the good news in a world of bad news. In a world of bad news, that we would be witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's a hard thing to do. Nehemiah finds that out in this book. But at first, he just needs to hear the news. He's actually been living a pretty decent life when his brother and some people he knows come back from a trip. And the trip is really far away. Jerusalem is far from Susa, maybe 50 days by animal, a couple of months. So any news is really far behind. Persian Twitter is not speedy. It comes by donkey or camel. So these guys are telling him, actually, things are really bad in Jerusalem. The people are living like animals. The, the city's been torn down. The gates have been burned. The, the word for survivor in Hebrew is the word remnant. 
It refers to something like uh, scraps that you would find underneath a table that nobody managed to eat. That's what the people of Israel are like. We're like the crumbs that no one managed to eat. It's a miserable existence for them. Don't you know, they say? And Nehemiah doesn't know. He's asking about it because he doesn't know. We ask hard questions, and then we really listen. That's how we respond to bad news. It's part of bearing witness, that we would listen. He doesn't respond. He doesn't talk about what, you know, the great things the king is doing. He just listens. Now, the hard thing for you and me to remember is that the Old Testament talks about something called the exile. And we tend to remember with the Old Testament the greatest hits. Genesis, Exodus, and then we jump to Jesus because it's great stuff. But actually, the people of Israel, for a long time, uh, were following God in the land that God had given them. And little by little, they would show up to church, and they would hear God talk about justice and, and mercy and, and things for the immigrant and the orphan and the poor and the widow and the oppressed. And they would go, yeah, 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 but like, let's sing some songs and sacrifice. And then a little bit more time would go on, and it was clearer and clearer to the prophets that these guys had kind of given up on the headlines of their time, that all they really wanted, actually, was kind of a religious experience, and they could live their lives. They weren't bearing witness. So they started to warn, hey, at some point, there will be consequences. At some point, it will get bad. And God allowed his people to be conquered. In 587 BC, the nation of Babylon came in and destroyed Israel. They tore the walls to the ground. They burned the gates. They killed people. And the people who lived, they stuck hooks in their bodies, and they dragged them away in chains. Slaves, exported to a foreign land. The Empire, of ba- the Empire of Babylon was a cruel and terrible place, and the Bible talks a lot about it. But this is true. This actually happens in world history. You could read a textbook and find out that Babylon conquered them in 587 B.C. The Bible bears witness to history, and history bears witness to the Bible. And in 539 B.C., God raised up Cyrus of Persia. Cyrus of Persia, who in an amazing series of campaigns, destroyed the entire Babylonian Empire. It's miraculous how fast he destroyed Babylon. And the Bible would say it's miraculous because God was involved. And when Cyrus comes through in world history, every nation sees him like this great liberator. Like he's conquering nations, he's setting people free, he lets folks go back to their land, and it sounds great. And it is in some ways, and it's not in others. It's the kind of freedom that Frederick Douglass talks about after the Emancipation Proclamation. People were free, to be hungry. People were free to the wind and the rain with, you know, no roof over their heads, to no land. People were free to famine, and it's amazing anybody survived. And the survivors, the very few who were left, are living like animals among the ruins. And actually, Nehemiah's own boss, and this happens in the book of Ezra, has actually said, you know what, here's the deal. I'll let some people build some things. We'll we'll free up some money from the treasury. And they start rebuilding for a little while. And then in Ezra, some people who are, well, kind of racists, actually just hate the Jews and want to make sure that this ends. And so they accuse these people of rebellion. They accuse them of trying to overthrow the government and the whole project stops. And Nehemiah maybe knows some of these things, but he doesn't really have to know because he's living a really good life. And he knows some good things have happened for the Jews and he doesn't really know what's going on far away in Jerusalem because he's in Susa and his life is great. We hear that he's the cupbearer to the king. Uh, which basically means he's incredibly important. He's always around the king. The king is always listening to him, and he always gets to kind of speak his mind. He hears about what's going on in the government. He's kind of like the head of the secret service, right? He, he drinks things to make sure that the king isn't being poisoned, so he's very trusted. And at the same time, he actually gets to kind of talk about policy and, and things that are going on in the Persian government because he's a really trusted advisor. And they're in Susa, the capital, but it's only the winter capital of Persia because you know, when it gets too hot in the Middle East and you're the king of the earth, you go down to Susa where you can hang out at the beaches and there are girls in bikinis and, you know, we can have great drinks by the sea and Nehemiah's pouring drinks like the bartender. And these guys come to town and he goes, what's going on in Jerusalem? And they go, it's not like this. It's not like this at all. Man, your life is not normal for all of our lives. You are the exception to the rule in Persia. And Nehemiah hears this and he has a choice. He can respond by choosing to live in the dream world he's in. Wow, that sucks for those guys. I'm going to go back to pouring drinks. Or he can choose to bear witness. And what Nehemiah does is he chooses compassion. We see him, he, he mourns, he weeps, he fasts, he stops eating and drinking and sleeping. 
because he realizes he has an advantage that other people don't. And he's trying to figure out what to do. Miles uh, McPherson is a, a guy I met at a church conference a little while ago. He's a pastor in San Diego and a good man. And he talks a little bit about what it's like to discover you have advantages. So I'm going to play this for you. Say amen if you don't talk about. Put your hands out. Why? We shake hands right-handed. I'm left-handed. If you're left-handed, raise your hand. The special people. Come on now. Come on now. Keep your hand up. These are all the most intelligent, good-looking people in the room. Look at In school, the desk was made for right-handed people. You can elbow, brace, right, and talk to the girl next to you at the same time. Say, hey, what's up? Because you're, right? I'm left-handed, so I'm out here. Hold up, girl. Hold up. I got a disadvantage. If you, if you want to get golf clubs and you're right-handed, you go to any golf shop, get your club right now. I got an order on Amazon. And when I was a kid, there was no Amazon, just the Amazon River, down, and, and, and whatever, down in South America. And, and if you want to get a, a, a catcher's mitt, you can go to any sporting goods store and get a catcher's mitt. I'm going to drive it to 10 stores. Maybe I will find one. And while you're home playing with your kid, I'm driving around looking for a catcher's mitt. And then you say to me, what's taking you so long? I got mine. Because you never had to be left-handed. You don't know the disadvantage of being left-handed. It doesn't mean that you are prejudiced against left-handed people. No, not necessarily. But it doesn't take away the disadvantage. It's called right privilege. Right privilege. I think that's incredible, not just because it's a great joke, but actually because I think it's a really good way of explaining privilege. Privilege is something that many people in our society have kind of come up with as an idea. I think it's a really clever way of talking about life in the world and in groups and out groups. I think the problem, of course, is that our culture only ever thinks of things in terms of us and them, me versus them. And so, of course, people with privilege are therefore bad people. And that's not really the case. In fact, actually, there's, there's something to be said for realizing that all sorts of people have all sorts of privileges, depending on which in-group you're in at any given moment. You've been given advantages that some people just don't have. And the question of the Bible is not, how do we feel ashamed for the fact that we were given advantages? The question the Bible would ask is, so now what are we going to do? How are we going to bear witness? How are we going to bear witness, those of us with college degrees, in a world where not everyone has one? How are we going to bear witness, those of us with shoes, in a world where not everyone has them? How are we going to bear witness? Some of us were at a faith and, faith and race forum this Wednesday, and we heard brothers and sisters in Christ talking about what it's like to live in the world that we live in. What can we do together? How can we use our advantages for others? We know that this happens consistently in the Bible, all over the place in Scripture, right? Joseph is somebody who ends up in Pharaoh's court, and his brothers are starving, and he realizes, right, he's, he's both got the headlines of the day and the story of who God is, and he's trying to figure out, what am I called to do right now? Moses, right, grows up in Pharaoh's court, he knows the people of Israel are slaves. He feels it. He goes, what am I called to do right now? Esther is in Persia, a different kingdom, and is queen. And her cousin Mordecai goes, look, this is what's going on. You know God's story. What do you think you're called to do at such a time as this? Nehemiah is having exactly the same moment. You and I are having exactly the same moment. And what Nehemiah chooses is compassion. Compassion is impossible unless you have privilege. Compassion is impossible unless you have an advantage. It's impossible. Follow me for a moment. Compassion in Latin literally means to suffer with. Come, which is with, and passion, to suffer. To suffer with. Compassion is when you suffer and you don't have to. Somebody else is suffering and you choose to join them in their suffering. That's what compassion is. So when you have a friend who's lost a child and you're just mourning with those who mourn, the way Jesus tells us to. You're joining them in their suffering. And you're able to bear witness that there's a God who loves them dearly and deeply, sometimes just by sitting in silence. When there are people you know in your community who don't have enough food because they've lost their jobs, 
because that's definitely happening in COVID where suddenly you have friends who used to be pretty comfortable in middle class and they can't seem to find toilet paper and they can't seem to afford diapers. And you're thinking, I'm just going to start bringing them dinner on a regular basis, right? That costs something of you. Compassion, right? I have an advantage that other people don't have. The problem is viewing something like privilege in terms of white and black and viewing something like privilege in terms of haves and have nots and those who are bad because they have and those who are good because they have not. The Bible calls us to a very different way. And one of the reasons we know that that's true is the best example in the Bible isn't Nehemiah, it's Jesus. Jesus, the God who we hear about in Philippians, who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but humbled himself to the point that he became like us, humbled himself to the point that he died on a cross for you and for me. Jesus bore witness, bore witness in the world in which we live to the God who loves us very dearly and very deeply. Nehemiah responds by listening. Nehemiah responds with compassion. Next up, he prays. He's mourning and he's weeping and he's fasting day and night. He's not eating, he's not sleeping, he's praying, he's thinking about what exactly is God calling me to do. And Nehemiah's prayer is really formal. And we get the sense that he's been praying a lot, so maybe this is just the only one he writes down. We get really kind of Nehemiah's journal entries and then sort of some narrative around what's actually going on. That's how this book works. But Nehemiah is saying, look, God, you're the God of heaven. He lives in Persia where there are completely different gods and where the story is really their gods beat all the other gods. Their gods win and my God sucks. So I should pray to their gods because their gods are clearly winners. And Nehemiah says, nah, even if it looks that way, even if it looks like our God is a loser, even if it looks like our God isn't real or our God's not around, I know the truth, that there's only one God, that it's the God of Israel, and that he's still in charge, confusing as that may sound, because I'm in Susa and my people are in real trouble. And so he cries out to the God because he is certain that that God is in charge, sovereign. And he says, look, you're the God of heaven, and I've heard that you're a God of steadfast love and of mercy, because I've read this book, but I also see what's going on. And so I'm just telling you, this is what's going on, but I've read this book. And I just want to remind you what you said in this book. What you said in this book is, if we fail to listen to you, we will experience the consequences. And you're clearly doing that, but you also say that when we experience the consequences, if we repent and cry out to you, you'll bring us back. You've told us that you would rather have mercy than judgment. You'd have rather have restoration and redemption than failure and sin and pain and death. Well, we've got failure and sin and pain and death, and I'm, I'm the first to say it's my fault. I'm the first to say it's my family. I'm the first to say it's me and I was wrong and I'm sorry. And now, God, what are you going to do? Nehemiah takes responsibility for other people's sins. Right? He's not the one who led the people into exile. He's not the one who didn't listen to the God of the universe. He goes, but that's my family. Those are my people. And by the way, I'm also a sinner, and I'm not going to pretend like I'm perfect. But I also know that my goal isn't to just suddenly be overwhelmed and hopeless and say, well, I'm just such a horrible sinner, and there's no way we can solve these problems. I know who you are, and I know your story. And so he reminds God of God's own character, of God's own nature. That is a spectacular way to pray. Whenever you are mad at God, whenever you hate the situation, whenever you feel like a failure, remind God and yourself of who he is in Jesus Christ. God loves to be reminded that we know who he is. And so the very end of the prayer, you keep hearing you. Jesus, Nehemiah is not talking about God, he's talking to God. This is an abstract theology. He thinks God's really listening and he goes, look, these are your servants, this is your story, this is your land, this is your plan, this is your problem. Come on, God, like what are you gonna do? Just reminding God that he's, he's involved with these people. And then at the very end, he says, and please give mercy to your servants today with this man. And this man is probably the king of Persia, which is to say the king of the earth. He's literally referred to as king of kings and lord of lords. That's true in Persian history. And Nehemiah doesn't really know what to do. And this prayer is beautiful and it's amazing. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah goes back to work. And it's a really anticlimactic moment, right? He, he listens, there's compassion, he's praying, and then it's the status quo. Like he goes back to his job, and that for months he goes back to his job. And it, it leads you to believe like maybe 
nothing's changed. Maybe Nehemiah, like maybe that was just like a religious exercise and he's just, he's escaping back into the world. This is why Karl Marx hated religion, right? It's the opiate of the masses. You people pray and you do nothing for the poor. And I think it's a fair critique a lot of the time. I remember uh, years ago watching the movie Hotel Rwanda with Don Cheadle. I think he got nominated for an Oscar. And in the movie, there's this scene where it, the whole idea of the movie is it's about the, the genocide that happened in Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And Don Cheadle is a hotel owner who's sheltering people from genocide. And there's an American news crew there. And the news crew says, look, they're filming things. And they turn to Don Cheadle, the hotel owner, and they say, I'm so sorry we're filming this. I mean, it's, and he says, no, 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 I totally understand. You need to film this, this needs to be news. The Americans need to look up from their dinners and see what's happening and get involved. And the news crew awkwardly looks at one another and says, what if they look up from their dinners and they say, that's horrible. And then they go back to dinner. And the Rwandans in the movie are confused, but you and I are not confused because we know the attention span of the average American and let's be real of you and me. We know that a lot of the time it's, man, it would be great if I could just like that on Facebook and then forget about it because other things have happened. You know what? There's a lot of bad news going on in the world right now. There's COVID and there's the racial stuff and there's all the stuff with the economy. And the truth is my life's okay and I can't handle all this negativity. So I'm just going to drink a little bit more than I used to. Or I'm just going to watch TV a little bit more than I used to. Or I'm just going to eat to kind of make my emotions feel better. This I know sounds familiar. And the reason it sounds familiar is I have the same thing going on. I know exactly how you feel. I'm there too. It's hard to not just want to run away in the world that we live in, and yet you and I are called to bear witness. Nehemiah is still bearing witness. It looks like regular life for months, but there's a whole lot more of this book. And so what we realize later in the book is Nehemiah is extremely decisive. He's a man of action, he gets stuff done. He doesn't talk, he gets involved, always. But this prayer period actually is essential to everything else that happens in the book. He spends months in prayer going, God, you need to, you need to show me what to do. He's praying, and he's discerning, and he's waiting for the right moment to act. And so it looks like normal life, but it's not normal life because something has changed inside Nehemiah. He realizes he's been called here, now. He's been called to bear witness. And so even though it looks like normal life, it's not normal life, he's waiting for his opportunity to act, for his shot to do what God is calling him to do. You and I, right? Some of us are just trying to live our normal lives and we still have to be witnesses. We still have to be witnesses. Even if it looks like things are normal, they are not normal because we know who God's called us to be. Uh, on April 4th, 1968, uh, the Reverend John Brooks got into gear. Uh, John Brooks is someone whose name you probably don't know and that's okay. I didn't know his name, but one day I saw his picture uh, on my dad's desk. Uh, and I'm going to show it to you because he's an adorable little man. This is John Brooks. Doesn't he look like you'd want to just hang out with him and hear stories? And John Brooks was a teacher and a Jesuit pastor in a little school called Holy Cross in Massachusetts. And on April the 4th, 1968, something really significant happened. Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. It's a very important day. It's worth remembering. And people all over the world, the world, were making speeches and praying and crying and coming together and talking about what had happened and writing stories about what had happened. But John Brooks responded differently. He got in his car and he started to drive. He started to drive up and down the eastern seaboard. He drove to the south. He drove all over the place. He was going to communities of color, looking for people. He was talking to community leaders. He was talking to school superintendents. He was talking to principals. He was looking for kids that would never have gotten a shot to go to college. That was what he did. He was a teacher at a little college. He goes looking for kids. And he's talking to folks about the most talented, the best, and the brightest. And he starts recruiting. Uh, no one's paying the cost for this. He's buying his own gas, he's putting himself up in hotels, he's talking to people, he's helping scholarship kids into the school, because it's an all-white school, pretty much, and he wants to do something. And little by little, he recruited people in that year, just the first year, 
He recruited 20 students. Among those students was Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice, Edward P. Jones, who won the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for fiction, Theodore Wells, who became a defense lawyer and a very successful one, and Ed Jenkins Jr., who has a Super Bowl ring because he was on the 1972 Miami Dolphins undefeated team. And he later went on to be a prominent civil rights activist. And when John Brooks was asked about the crazy success of this, he said, you know, I think we just got lucky, which is remarkable and humble. But I think what he really means is that the God of the universe was moving through his actions. But when Clarence Thomas was asked about John Brooks, he said, we weren't a project to him. We were just kids who needed a shot. That's what God can do. And I'm telling you this, it wasn't just because Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Reverend Brooks had clearly been praying for a long period of time about what to do in the civil rights movement, what God was calling him to do with the skill set, with the position in society, with the reality that he lived in. What, what is God calling me to do, given God's story, given the headlines of today? He was waiting and discerning, waiting for his opportunity to bear witness. And so when the news came and it was terrible, he knew how to respond. You and I are called to bear witness, to be people who respond by listening, by well, being compassionate in prayer, and then really discerning what God is calling us to do. Not being overwhelmed by the problems of the world, not trying to escape the problems of the world, but moving as witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ in a world filled with bad news.